أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you all to our third session on Surah Al-Hujurat and we've reached ayah number seven where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَاعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِتُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبِ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانَ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِصْيَانَ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ Allah says, and know that the messenger of God is among you. Were he to obey you in many matters, you would suffer. But God has caused you to love faith and has beautified it in your hearts. And he has caused you to despise disbelief, iniquity, and disobedience. Such are the rightly guided. If you recall, my dear brothers and sisters, in our last session, we mentioned the story of Al-Walid ibn Uqba. The Prophet ﷺ, as many of you are now familiar, in the ninth year after the Hijrah, it was known as Amul Wufud, the year of delegations. And many tribes came into the fold of Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ, as the as the head of state, he's running a government. It was time to collect uh, zakat from many of the tribes. So the Prophet ﷺ, he appointed Al Walid ibn Uqba to collect the zakat from Bani Mustalaq, one of the, the tribes in that region. So Al Walid ibn Uqba travels and he goes to as an envoy of the prophet as a tax collector to collect zakat now because al walid ibn uqba had past conflicts with bani mustalaq when he arrived in their region in their village they all came out to receive him but because of the prejudice that he had towards them he interpreted them coming out as them coming together to fight him. So they, he thought that they had come out of their homes to cause him physical harm or to kill him. So he retreats, he rushes back to Medina, and he starts to spread the news that Bani Mustalaq, they have apostated, and they were trying to kill me. Now. Luckily, the Prophet ﷺ is connected to revelation. And Jibra'il immediately discloses to the Prophet that the reports of Walid ibn Uqba are false and there was no attempt on his life. Now, interestingly, there were still a group among the companions who were not convinced. And they still insisted and they were pressuring the Prophet to assemble an army and fight. So despite the fact that they were absolved and they were exonerated by God and the messenger, there were still a group who were supporting the narrative and the testimony of Walid ibn Uqba. So there, was, there were those who were suggesting to the Prophet that let us go and perhaps check to make sure. Let us go fully armed and face off against Bani Mustalaq. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, He says, وَعْلَمُ أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ And know that the Messenger of God is among you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He's recounting and reminding the Muslim community of some of the great blessings that he has bestowed upon them. And, and one of the greatest blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal is that the Messenger of God is with you, that He's among you. That 
one of the bounties, one of the greatest bounties of God, if not the greatest bounty of Allah, is the fact that there is a messenger of God among you who has access to knowledge that is divine. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ The presence of the Prophet is mentioned here as a great blessing. That his mere presence is a ni'mah. If, if we look at Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number, 30, Surah number 8, verse 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ that, O oh Muhammad, we would not punish them as long as you are among them. That the Prophet ﷺ acted as a safety net for his community. That because he is among them, divine wrath will not descend upon them. In the same way that it used to descend upon previous nations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Civilizations were wiped out. They were annihilated because of their iniquities. But because out of, out of respect for the final messenger of God, Allah says that as long as he is among you, that this type of divine wrath will not descend upon you. In fact, there is a narration from the Prophet himself where he says that my life, is a great good for you. When I'm alive, you benefit from me. You learn from me. I, can, I am able to impart my wisdom and my knowledge to you. You are able to recount the narrations that you hear from me. You're, you're able to pass around this knowledge. My life is a great good for you. And my death is a great good for you. So the Prophet says that my life is a ni'mah for you. And even my death is a blessing for you. Why is it a blessing? Because the Quran, for example, in Surah at tawbah verse 94, and we've, we've covered this verse, Allah says, وَقُلِ عَمَلُوا فَسَيَرَ اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ That the Prophet's presence continues even after he passes away. That he still acts as a guardian and, and one who oversees the actions of people of the Ummah. And then the Prophet says, <laughs> That your actions are presented to me on a daily basis. The Prophet says that when I see that you are doing good, when I see that you're performing, that you're doing righteous acts, I ask Allah to give you the tawfiq to do more. So even though the Prophet has passed away, when we do good, we earn the dua of the Prophet. وَمَا كَانَ مِنْ قَبِيحٍ إِسْتَغْفَرْتُ اللَّهَ لَكُمْ And when you commit evil, when you commit shameful acts, when you commit sin, the Prophet says that I, I ask God to pardon you. I ask Him to forgive you. So you see that when Allah says, وَعْلَمُ أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Know that the Messenger of God is among you. His presence is enjoyed by those who lived with Him during His life. And even us who live 14 centuries after His demise, we continue to benefit from his presence. So even though he's in Alam al Barzakh and we're in Alam al Dunya, there is still an ongoing relationship with the Prophet. That each and every one of us, we have a relationship with the Prophet, and it's a blessing that we have to appreciate. So the first ni'mah is that the Prophet is among you. That he has knowledge that none of you have access to. And that is knowledge through wahi, through, through revelation. And then Allah speaks about 
one of the qualities of the Prophet. لو يطيعكم في كثيرا من الأمر العنتم. Another great blessing is that the Prophet doesn't obey us. So his presence is a, is a source of inspiration. It's a source of, of spiritual empowerment for us. And Allah says that another blessing is that he doesn't listen to you. Why? Because Allah says that if he were to obey you, if he were to follow your suggestions, لو يطيعكم في كثيرا من الأمر Allah says that if, that were he to obey you in many matters, so we're not just talking about one or two things, in many issues, if he were to obey you in many matters, you would suffer. Now who is Allah speaking to? Who is making suggestions to the Prophet? Who... Who, who, who are the ones who are making recommendations to the Prophet? The companions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, interestingly in this verse, He says, لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِتُمْ if, if the Prophet were to always listen to the advice, to the recommendations, to the suggestions of his companions, Allah says that you would suffer greatly. Whether it's minor administrative issues or major issues. Now with this verse in mind, now when you read this ayah, If the Prophet were to obey you in many matters, you would suffer. Do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would leave the matter of khilafah in their hands? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if he were to obey you, you would suffer greatly because you don't you don't know what's good for yourselves. The Prophet is told that that he Allah tells us that it's a blessing that he doesn't obey us. We he's consultative. He's he's the best listener. But he's not impressionable. The Prophet is not easily influenced by the demands and the desires of his companions and his followers. لو يطيعكم في كثيرا من الأمر. We would perish. As a Muslim community, we would perish if the Prophet followed the suggestions and the advice of his companions without discerning. So if Allah says, لو يطيعكم في كثيرا, if the Prophet were to listen to you, you would suffer. Allah is telling the, the Prophet that even when it comes to minor issues, don't listen to them. Do you think Allah is going to leave something like the Khilafah, which, in which the, the religion of Islam depends on, the survival of the Ummah depends on who leads after the Prophet? He's just going to leave it in the hands of the people, in the hands of his followers? In Surah Al Mu'minun, Surah number 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَلَوْ اتَّبَعَ الْحَقُّ أَهْوَاءَهُمْ If the truth followed their desires, meaning if, if it was up to people to decide what is true and what is false, if the truth followed their desires, meaning the desires of people, Allah says, لَفَسَدَتِ السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمِنْ فِيهِمْ Allah says that if, if truth was based on popular demand, Allah says, He mentions the consequence. Allah says, the heavens and the earth and all that is in between would be corrupt, would perish. This shows you, brothers and sisters, that it's truly a blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that it's a blessing that the messenger, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoints individuals with strong character, who are not impressionable, who are not easily influenced. Allah is saying that it's a blessing that the messenger does not obey you, that he doesn't follow your desires, that he's a messenger of great resolve. لو يطيعكم في كثيرا من الأمر لعنتم. If the Prophet were 
to obey you in many matters you would suffer. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ You know, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants all human beings to achieve salvation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never created anyone because He wants them to perish or He wants them to suffer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants all of us to enjoy the pleasure of being His servants, the pleasure of being close to Him, the pleasure of divine proximity. And therefore you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated, He has created means for us to reach Him. How did Allah do this? وَلَكِنْ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Now unlike Christianity, you know, many of you are probably familiar with the, the doctrine of original sin. In Christian theology, the idea is that human beings are born sinful. So they're born with at a disadvantage. You're born evil, sinful. You inherited the great sin of your predecessors. In the Islamic tradition, interestingly, the Prophet ﷺ, what does he say? Kullu mawludin yuladu ala al-fitra. He dispels this, this monstrous lie that human beings are born as inherently evil or sinful. The Prophet says, every child is born upon the fitra. In the Islamic tradition, we don't even believe that human beings are born neutral. So you have one extreme, the doctrine of original sin, where people, according to Christian theology, they're born sinful. That's why you have this process of, you know, in, in, you know, the process of baptism when they're when they're young. So you have one extreme, born sinful, and then you might think that Islam is moderate. Islam doesn't say that human beings are born. Inherently good nor are they inherently evil. They're born neutral, but you find no in the Islamic tradition We don't believe that people are born as neutral beings We believe what that they are born upon the fitra. What is this fitra? This fitra Allah mentions it in surat Ar-Rum verse 30 فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا Fitra means that each human being, without exception, is born with a natural inclination towards God. So we are all born with an inclination towards God and an, an inclination towards goodness. So in Islam, a child is not even neutral. Now we reject the notion that they're born sinful. We also reject the notion that human beings are neutral. No, they have nur in their hearts. They come into this world with an advantage, meaning they're already leaning towards God. They're already moving in the direction of God. You know, subhanAllah, even some scholars, they note that when you go to Hajj, when you go to Mecca, we perform tawaf around the Kaaba. Don't you find it interesting that when you, when you perform tawaf, you perform tawaf counterclockwise? Now, some scholars wonder, why is it that we perform tawaf counterclockwise? Why is it not clockwise? Some scholars, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Some scholars, they, they, they theorize that perhaps the reason why we perform tawaf counterclockwise is because the human heart is situated in the center, but slightly to the left. 
And when you perform tawaf, you're positioning your body in a way where the heart is inclining towards the Kaaba. And this is a reminder that we are all created with an inclination towards God. That this is a reminder of our fitrah. That we're not born as neutral beings. We are born with this fitrah, with this initial light, with this initial goodness. And this is what Allah means when He says, Allah has made faith beloved to you. He has, made, he has created you in a way that you love faith. You are attracted to it. And He has made it attractive and He has beautified it in your hearts, to your hearts. And that's why when you do good, you know, when you give charity, when you volunteer, you feel good. You feel at peace. Why do you feel at peace? Where, where does this joy come from? Why is it that you feel a sense of tranquility when you remember God, when you pray, when you make dua? It's not random that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you in a way where He has you, you're attracted to these things. This attraction towards to goodness, this inclination towards God and virtue and nobility, this is something that God has infused within you. That He is the one. God has made faith loved by you. And He has beautified it in your hearts. So not only has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you inclined towards goodness not not only has he made not only has he made faith attractive to you attractive in your eyes he has made disbelief hypocrisy iniquity disobedience reprehensible to you and that's why when you commit a sin you feel regret that's why you feel this internal disturbance. When you commit haram, this is where, this is a nafsul lawama. And this is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that He gave us conscience that we feel guilt when we commit sin. And this, this feeling of guilt is a blessing because it's sending a signal to you that you are damaging your soul. Guilt is the pain signal of the soul. You know, in the same way when you, when you feel pain, you know, pain has a function. Pain is sending a message to you that there's something wrong. That damage is being inflicted upon the body. Soul, uh, guilt, is a type of pain that the soul is experiencing. And therefore, it's meant to indicate, to send a message to you that you're causing damage to your soul. This is the function of a nafsul lawam. And where does this come from? This is also one of the gifts of God. That Allah has made evil, He's made disbelief, disobedience, reprehensible to you. So you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a system where he has given you advantages. He is already facilitating your guidance by making faith attractive to you, by making you inclined towards goodness, by making evil and corruption and sin repulsive and reprehensible to you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in ayah number 8, فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةً Wallahu alimun hakim. A bounty of God. This is a this is a bounty of Allah. The fact that the messenger is among you, the fact that he doesn't obey you, he doesn't just follow your whims and your desires and your suggestions, but he's rooted in divine knowledge. It's a bounty of God that he has made you incline towards him. That you're already born with a recognition of a higher power. 
It's a bounty of Allah Azza wa Jal that you are you 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 find sin and evil and wicked actions, you find them reprehensible. Fadlan min Allahi wa ni'matan wallahu alimun hakim. A bounty of God, a blessing. Now the word fadlan and the word ni'mah are mentioned here. Now fadlan min Allah, it's a bounty of God. Now a fadl is basically, and fadl and ni'mah, it's speaking about this interaction where God bestows a blessing upon us. Now when God bestows a blessing, there is a giver and there's a receiver. You know, sometimes when people give, they do it because there's something in it for them. You might give because down the road you might need a favor. You might help because you're also, there's a vested interest. But the idea of fadl, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's called fadl لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ غَيْرَ مُحْتَاجٍ إِلَيْهِ That these blessings, God gives them to you while He doesn't need them. He doesn't need anything from you. And a ni'mah is called ni'mah because it is a blessing that the servant needs. So it's it's looking at the, the, dis, the disbursement of blessings from the, from the perspective of God who gives even though he has no need and the servant who receives these blessings and they are in dire need of them. فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةً وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Everything that God gives is based on wisdom. It's based on His knowledge. It's not haphazard. Um, so, first, uh, sorry, one second. Uh, yeah, so, uh, first question. Um, you talked about how uh, we shouldn't flatter each other and we should even reveal uh, each other's blemishes as a proper mirror. Now, that, that seems really tricky, um, where it's very hard. How, how do we give feedback effectively and apply to and how do we receive feedback and know that the feedback that we give will not be negatively taken, which is a very common. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, I think, I think you have to use your, you have to use your judgment and your common sense. I mean, if, if, if you don't know the person and this is your first encounter with them, it's probably not the best time to offer them constructive criticism. You have to build some rapport with people. You know, if if you know if if you feel comfortable and you feel that you're that this person may take your advice, you know, privately approach them and make sure you, you know, what I always do if I ever if I ever feel that I need to give advice to someone. I, I begin by by highlighting their good qualities, you know. Because sometimes, if you just begin straight away by mentioning their shortcomings and where they failed, their moral failures, it's a it's a bit difficult to digest. So sometimes you have to recognize the good that they do. You have to always uh, qualify your your advice by saying that you know I know you have the best of intentions. I'm not doubting your intentions, you seem like a very kind-hearted person, but perhaps, you know, this is something to think about. Maybe, maybe you know, it could have been, uh, uh, it could have been done this way. So I, I think that you have to be gentle. You shouldn't use absolutes. You know, when you want to give advice and you want to offer constructive criticism, the way you say things is, is very important. And it's also, it's also important to keep in mind that it's possible that you do all of those things and someone is still offended. Some people just don't take constructive criticism well. And but that's not your fault. You know, those who are not able to take constructive criticism, that's their problem because th that is an indication of arrogance. A humble person should welcome feedback, should welcome constructive criticism because how else are you supposed to grow without constructive criticism so when you receive criticism you know before because it's 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 human nature to get defensive when people try to correct you or when people point out you know mistakes that you've made or failures 
So you have to always remind yourself that be humble, that this, you know, this uneasiness that you feel is, is coming from a place, it's coming from arrogance. And so you have to kind of silence that inner voice that's, that's offended by the constructive criticism. Because humble people are not offended by uh, constructive criticism. And when you offer advice, when you offer criticism, it should be done purely for the sake of God. If there is even an inkling in you that's, that makes you happy to kind of point out this person's mistakes, then you shouldn't be the one giving the constructive criticism. That it has, you have to check your niya and say that I'm doing this because I love this person, I care about this person, and I'm doing it solely for the sake of God. If you're doing it because you want to show that you're superior to them, that you're more knowledgeable, that you're more pious, then it's better for you to stay silent. So in the same way that the, the recipient of criticism has to be humble, the one who is giving the constructive criticism also has to be humble. That you should not do it from a place of, of superiority, that you should not feel superior to that person. You should not you know, uh, take pleasure in, in highlighting the shortcomings of other people. If you feel that there's even a trace of that in your heart, then maybe you shouldn't be the person to give constructive criticism. Uh, thank you. That was a really good explanation. Yeah. Um, just one follow up someone was asking online. Uh, what, what about the case of your spouse asking if something makes them look good and you don't want to disappoint them by telling them that it may not? Can you re repeat the question? case of uh, your spouse asking something makes them look good and you're not wanting to disappoint them by telling them the truth so like a white lie type of a situation also like literally if if they if they try on some clothes and they ask you how do i look right right i guess this is kind of asking basically like how, what if telling the truth is gonna hurt someone's feelings <sighs> i mean in islam we don't have we don't have something called uh you know a, a white lie you know, if if you feel that something doesn't uh, look good, you know, you either you know find a way to evade to evade the question, or you can make a general statement by saying that you know, you know, I I, I think that so, so the, the question is that this is a someone that's saying if if my spouse you know asks me do I look good and you don't think that they look good. Should you be honest? That was, specific, that, that was a specific question, yes. See, this is where diplomacy is needed, right? So uh, if, you don't, if you don't feel that it looks good, you know, I, I think it's healthy to be honest. And you, you could say that I think that you're beautiful, but I think, I think there's uh, another outfit that looks better. So I think the, the way that you say things, I, I don't think that you should say that you look hideous, you look ugly, take it off before I go blind. You know, you could say that you look beautiful, but perhaps you look better, you know, in, uh, in, another, in another outfit, for example. So, it, you know, th this, this reminds me of, uh, of the story of the, uh, the king who saw a dream. You know, as I said, it's all about the way that you frame things. So there was a, uh, a king who had a dream that all of his teeth fell out. And it seems a lot of people have these types of dreams where your teeth fall out. And they say that that means that... So anyway, the king summons dream interpreters. And the first dream interpreter told him that if you see all of your teeth falling out in your dream, that means your family and all your relatives are going to die. So the, the king became upset and he... He executed the dream interpreter. So then he called upon another guy, another dream interpreter. And he told him that I, I saw a dream that all my teeth were falling out. The man said, it means that you will live the longest among your people, among your family. He gave the same exact answer, but he put it in a way that was, was a lot easier for the, the king to process. You know, your entire family dying and you living the longest, that's, it's the same message, but 
the way he packaged that message was different. So I think the same principle applies if your spouse is uh, is asking you how they look. Yeah. Another question related to the first verse you covered. Um, if the masses cannot be trusted as a, to know what to do in, in a given situation, uh, then of course that kind of goes against the traditional thoughts about democracy nowadays. Uh, what should be the model for leadership and governance while the Imam is an awful take to? Now, it's a good question because Islam doesn't have an issue with uh, with majority. So, for example, you know, in uh, in fiqh, you know, sometimes we appeal to the majority opinion as supporting evidence, right? So, yes, if you're talking about the majority of people in general, then yeah, that's that's not an indicator of of truth or of accuracy. But if you're talking about the majority opinion of a specialized group, then the majority opinion carries weight. So when you say that the majority of ulama have a certain view, you can't discount that by saying, oh, well, the majority doesn't matter. No, we're talking about a specialized majority. We're talking about a specialized majority. So it's it's a bit different than just making a blanket statement and saying that, you know, majority doesn't have uh, it doesn't have uh, any uh, any weight. But uh, in, in an Islamic society, there there has to be. I mean, if you look at, for example, the Khilafah of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the reason why, because initially he refused to to assume the, the Khilafah. So even though he is appointed by God, as we see in in Shia theology, him assuming that the, the official political power, he initially refused. But he accepted when he saw that the majority of the Ummah wanted that. So in order for you to establish a government, an Islamic government, you don't need the majority for legitimacy. You need the majority for participation, right? So when, when we speak about Islamic governance, the idea of bay'ah, for example, the idea of bay'ah from our perspective in Shia theology, when people were giving bay'ah to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, their bay'ah was not giving him legitimacy because his legitimacy comes from God. Bay'ah to the Imam was what? was you have the majority of people in that society committing to the vision of that leader putting their hands in his hands and and you know making a commitment to be participants in moving the society in a direction that is pleasing to god so the majority has has its significance so following the majority is problematic if you're trying to ascertain truth, especially when it's a non-specialized majority. But in order for you to build a community, to establish a government, you need majority participation. You know, you, you cannot give people, you cannot implement the values of Islam unless you have majority participation. Now, the majority doesn't give legitimacy to Islam because Islam is legitimate whether people follow it or not. But the majority is needed for participation and to move the ummah in uh, in the right direction. Does that make sense? Uh, partially, yes. And I guess the other half of it would be then... So, I, I guess it sounds like you're saying that there's two aspects. One is that the leadership comes from whoever are considered the experts in the field. Mm -hmm. And the majority is there as participants, uh, and I guess that's that's kind of how societies, or even like the government organizations and stuff, would be run. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. 
yeah, it's, I guess it doesn't sound like a full governance model because you kind of have a chicken and egg problem there, like selecting the beginning, of selecting that experts and identifying them in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I think this is a, uh, it's a very nuanced discussion that requires, uh, it requires a bit more, uh, a bit more discussion. So, so my, my. Uh, so so what exactly so we're we're talking about the are we speaking about a specific uh, verse the first verse where where Allah says lo yuti'ukum fi kathiran min al-amr now we know that the prophet sallallahu alaihi was was consultative when it came to matters that were not religious that the, the prophet sallallahu alaihi did not have a problem consulting with his companions, but you you rarely have the prophet asking, you know, the Muslims, you know, we're just going to go with what the majority says. I, I can't think of an instance where the prophet gave, uh, you know, made a decision based on what the majority wanted. Now he consulted, but the majority was never used by the prophet as. Uh, from from what I, I mean, I could be wrong. I can't think of any specific examples, but so the, yeah, the prophet was consultative. He 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 was not. Uh, he didn't act as a dictator when it came to religious matters, matters that were decided by God. Of course, the prophet is not going to, you know, con, you know, consult his companions on you know how many how many days out of the year should we fast or how many like should this particular prayer be. These are matters decided by God and His Messenger, but administrative issues. You know, uh, tact. You know, uh, military tactics. That is, you know, determined. You know, through through consultation and and so on and so forth. But did the prophet ever make a decision because the majority of the companions wanted something? I I, I can't think of an instance where that would be the case. Uh, almost sounds like a CEO type model, where you have. Listening to his advisors, but not just going by their uh, simple majority. Yeah, I mean, if if you if you look at uh, even Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, you know, in in many cases, uh, yeah, he he never really took. Uh, I mean, he had people that the majority supported him, but he didn't refer to the majority for policy. You know. Because because the law is very the law of God is is very clear and it's not uh, it wasn't a matter of I mean even some of the people that he appointed or or that he deposed were probably very popular but uh, but the Imam Ali Salam you know removed them from power especially people from Uthman ibn Affan's administration you know they're they're from the Umayyads they have a lot of they they have they have numbers and so. It would be interesting to see if, if there's an example of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt or the Prophet making a decision because of popular demand. I can't think of a, I can't think of an instance. Now, as as long as as long as see po popular demand, the the desire of the majority is only problematic if it violates any of the tenets of the Sharia. So if it if it's a neutral issue, or if it's an issue that is not infringing upon the limits set by God, there's nothing wrong with, you know, going uh, following the uh, the desire of the majority, as long as the desire of the majority doesn't transgress the boundaries that are set by the Sharia. So there's there's nothing inherently problematic, you know, in you know asking you know what what do the majority of the people want. But if we're following the majority at the expense of, of violating God's laws, that's when it's problematic.